my childhood, when I grew up in the northwest corner of Victoria, cooler than Melly. Cold as the Arctic in winter, in the summer, hotter than hell itself. We lived in a government research station. We were never allowed a dog because of the fear, terrible fear of parasites they could carry and infect you with. This is a story from some 40 years ago in a remote part of Victoria. When life was a lot simpler, no fancy soaps or shampoos, certainly nothing to shampoo the dog with, much for our regret. No, the best we could do was take the dog down a dam, give it a good long swim, and make bloody sure you're standing upwind as the dog goes at a good distance, at least till it dried off. If you brought the dog on the farm vehicle, make sure the dog stayed out back on the tray. It could be well be a little intense with the odour inside the cabin, especially on a hot day. Now, very limited drugs for controlling the parasites are honouring the dog. So these parasites were much feared if they got into humans. But when my younger sister started to grow up, my father relented. She got one of the pups from the farm sheepdog litter. My father said she picked the run of the litter. As I recall, there wasn't much of a run about it. It was this huge, hairy, lovable mutt, which she so much adored and so did we. My father was not allowed to have an animal inside, no matter how cuddly or quiet they were. That included the cat, pet mice, pet lambs, the dog, but the budgie was allowed inside at night as long as it didn't sing to any ABC news on the radio. The, the dog, of course, being a somewhat 200 pound tank, would like to come charging in the back door as soon as it was open in the morning, carrying on down the hall, slipping and sliding on the line as it was eager to get into my sister's bedroom and jump up on the bed. You could hear the bed creaking and groaning under the strain. I remember thinking, the bed's going to give way under the strain. Father, upon hearing the commotion, would get out of bed and say not very savoury things to the dog. My sister would then have to take it outside, which I'm sure the bed was very grateful. As I have mentioned, this dog was very long-haired and fed on the dry dog food, mixed biff as I recall. It came in a large hessian bag you always knew when a new bag had arrived by the very distinctive odour that it gave off, which, not surprising given it contained blood and bone, dried meat pellets, pollen, bran, with a good deal of lard and a range of other things, which I have to say, that gave it a distinctive bouquet of its own, uh, which had a distinctive appeal to both the dog and the cat. The dog did not share the cat's enthusiasm what it considered its food, and the dog would drag off this huge bowl of food, and the father would have to go and retrieve it. Having been totally sick of this carrying on, and deciding to fix the problem, and on a more sharing, a problem on sharing on a more permanent basis, he came to get a 20 litre drum, cut it in half, and then with chain and nails and screw, and secured it, this large food bowl, to the big old post, right and fill it nearly to the top. Given this food mix and the very hot weather in the summer, the aroma coming from it was definitely an acquired taste, which the cat and the dog seemed to enjoy. However, being near the back door was less appealing to others, including my mother, as were the fox. <coughs> now, my father now had the problem of moving the floor food, which he had so lovingly and permanently attached to post, to a more Discreet distance, given the food mix called Biff, as I remember, uh, uh, given the food mix called Biff, as I recall, uh, and as we are what we eat, this long haired dog could not help smelling like a dragging pile of carpet, which people had done unmentionable things in the drunken party a month or so ago.